Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I am your host, Heather Tesco. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and be more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode, I think it's 187, 88, I, who knows, but it's about something I really love, which is shopping. I've already done an episode on Thomas Gresham and England's first mall. I will link to that in the show notes at englandcast.com slash markets. That gives a clue as to what this episode is about. The URL, markets. So this episode is on markets in Tudor London. Before we get started, though, your regular reminder, TudorCon is coming up September 8th through 10th. Yeah, September 8th through 10th, 2023. I have updated the page, finally, at englandcast.com slash TudorCon to include all the speakers that we have so far and also, you know, better FAQs, more information. So head over there, englandcast.com slash TudorCon to find out all the details and start to make your plans for coming to beautiful Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and communing with your fellow Tudor history nerds, September 8th through 10th, 2023. So I actually thought about doing this episode because I was thinking back to a time that my dear friend Paul took me to Leadenhall Market when I lived in London. He worked at the Lloyd's building and I met him for lunch, and he proceeded to give me a long history lesson on the market. This was like 20 years ago, but for some reason I thought about it the other day and I thought to myself, self, you really ought to do an episode on the markets of London during the 16th century. So here we are. During the 16th century, the number of markets in England grew significantly. And in London too, the country's economy expanded and commerce became more widespread. The markets were large, were open air, And you would buy a variety of goods there, food, clothing, household items. Of course, there were no grocery stores. So this is where people would do their food shopping. Many of the markets were in town centers in towns across the UK. And they served as the heart of the economic and social life for the surrounding communities. And in this episode, we're going to talk about three of the biggest ones in London. We'll start with the one I know best, Leadenhall. You probably know Leadenhall Market even if you've never been there because it was the setting for Diagon Alley in the Harry Potter movies. It's in the center of the old Roman Londinium. The Forum and the Basilica are actually pretty much right below it. So getting food in the 16th century was a pretty complicated thing, especially if you weren't like a farmer and grew your own. Today, we have fridges and freezers to make food storage easier. But of course, back then, they had to visit the market frequently to get fresh food. Plus, you think about all of the other sorts of like vermin in cities. You wouldn't want to keep food just sort of laying around in a city, especially. So, you know, you would go to the market regularly to get your food. Side note, you can see my episode on refrigeration in Tudor England from, gosh, I think it was the summer of 2018. I will find it and link to it in the show notes. Anyway, to simplify the shopping experience, some streets actually became known for their certain products. So things like Fish Street, known for the fishmongers. Other markets were named after landmarks like the Stocks Market. This market was supposed to be for butchers and fishmongers and may have been named after the Stocks, which were the only permanent stocks in the city from the 13th century. So the former Lord Mayor, Richard Dick Whittington, actually got the lease of Leadenhall Market, the building in 1408, and then the site in 1411, and then he gifted that to the City of London. Since then, the City of London Corporation has been operating the market. In a short period of time, Leadenhall Market became one of the top destinations in London for eggs, meat, game, grain, poultry, and fish. The meat and fish market was located in a series of courts behind the Grand Leadenhall Market mansion on Leadenhall Street. John Croxton designed and completed the original market in 1440, and he transformed the original hall into a two-story rectangular quadrangle complete with a public granary, 
lots of storage rooms, and a tiny side chapel. The building's battlements and turrets also suggest that it might have been fortified, potentially in preparation for food shortages or if there was social unrest, if there were bad harvests and people tried to storm storm it to get food. Prior to the expansion, trade took place in the narrow streets surrounding the market, but with its completion, all the transactions were conducted within that arcade itself. It gained significance as a commercial center in 1463 when it was chosen as the site for the Tronage, a royal tax on wool and wool weighing. In 1488, it was decreed that leather could only be sold to Londoners at Leadenhall Market. The leather market later relocated to Bermondsey, though. I have to tell you, this is like such a side note, totally unrelated to anything. But whenever I see the word Bermondsey or think about it in my head, I think about riding the Jubilee line and I think about the recording. I don't know if it's still like this. It's been a long time since I've been on the Jubilee line. But the the recording that would come on that would tell you the next station and stuff for the Jubilee line, the woman was so happy when she said it and she sounded so excited. And it always made me feel really uncomfortable because nobody should be that animated on the and I know it was a recording, like I get that, but I just remember. She would say, the next station stop is Bermondsey. I was like, wow, whoever she was when she recorded that, she had a lot of coffee. And anyway, that's my side note about Bermondsey. If you live in Bermondsey and you ride the Jubilee line, can you tell me if the recording still sounds that excited? I would love to know. I just remember it was something that struck me. The next station is Bermondsey. It was like, whoa, calm down. Anyway. Bermondsey, totally unrelated to anything. Back to markets. London markets had actually established regulations regarding who could sell goods and on which days. Leadenhall Market also had a granary for the poor relief and storage space for local parades and pageants. Basically, it was like a one stop shop for everything you needed food wise. Vendors from the countryside, referred to as foreigners, were allowed to sell meat there on Wednesdays and Saturdays. However, in 1564, they revoked the foreigner Wednesday allowance because there were some permanent stalls that London butchers could buy, and they were worried about competition. So then the foreigners moved over to Gracechurch Street Market, which was more accommodating to country sellers, and they also sold dairy products, pork, veal, and produce. Another large market that Tudor Londoners would have been able to shop at was Billingsgate, which is still in existence. It's the UK's largest inland fish market. It takes its name from Billingsgate, which was a ward in the southeast corner of the city of London, where the Riverside Market was originally established. In its original location, up until the 19th century, Billingsgate was actually the largest fish market in the world. The origins of Billingsgate, which was the Watergate and Harbour on the north side of the Thames between London Bridge and the Tower of London, are uncertain. Dates back to around 1000 was likely built to respond to the construction, the reconstruction of London Bridge. I did an episode on London Bridge as well, so I'm just going to have to find all these old episodes and link to them in the show notes. Billingsgate was actually London's main dock during the late 16th century. According to the 12th century writer Geoffrey Monmouth, the name Billingsgate was inspired by the ancient British King Belin, who built the gate in 400 BC. However, in his survey of London, John Stowe suggests that the name came from a more recent owner, Bailing or Billing. Who knows? It's a history's mystery. In the early Middle Ages, Queen Hythe was the main harbor for trade, but when London Bridge was rebuilt, it made it harder for ships to navigate to Queen Hythe, so Billingsgate became the alternative port and market. In 1224, Henry III required all corn and fish to be sold at Queen Hythe to better manage customs duties. However, after his rule, Edward I allowed fishmongers to land their fish anywhere, leading to the fish market moving from Old Fish Street near Queen Hythe to Bride Street, later New Fish Street, near Billingsgate. At the end of the Middle Ages, Queen Hythe still held a little bit of prestige, despite no longer being London's only port. In 1463, as ships were deterred from reaching Queen Hythe due to a lax drawbridge at London Bridge, Edward IV ordered all ships to unload at Queen Hythe. 
if multiple ships entered the river at once, some were allowed to dock at Billingsgate, but Queen Hythe was given priority. Over the years, there was so much congestion caused by the bridge that the use of Queen Hythe decreased so drastically that by 1603, it was, as John Stowe said in his survey of London, almost forsaken. By this time, Billingsgate had risen to become London's most important harbor. Stowe writes that Billingsgate is, at present, a large watergate, port, or harbor for ships and boats, commonly arriving there with fish, both fresh and salt, shellfishes, salt, oranges, onions, and other fruits and roots, wheat, rye, and grain of diverse sorts, for service of the city and other parts of this realm adjoining. This gate is now more frequented than of old time when the Queen's Hythe was used. Billingsgate became a dedicated fish market in the 17th century, and in 1699, an Act of Parliament designated it a free open market for all types of fish. And as London was England's top port and Billingsgate was the top harbor, Billingsgate was actually England's leading port. One final market that Tudor Londoners could shop at was Smithfield, which is still in existence as the largest and oldest EU-approved wholesale meat market in the UK. Smoothfield, later known as Smithfield, was once a large open space near St. Bartholomew's Priory outside city limits. Its name derived from smith, meaning smooth. Smithfield has a rich history as a key site in London for over a thousand years. It was located outside the city walls, and its grassy fields and proximity to the River Fleet made it ideal for livestock markets. The area was also surrounded by religious institutions with the Augustinian nunnery of St. Mary Clerkenwell to the north and St. Bartholomew's Priory and Hospital to the south, founded in 1123. In the 12th century, it was used for jousts and tournaments, but by the late Middle Ages, it also became famous for its livestock market. From the 13th century, it was also used for execution of criminals, including Watt Tyler and William Wallace. This was the go-to place before Tyburn. And during the Tudor period, many religious dissenters, both Catholic and Protestant, were executed at Smithfield. There's actually, you can look up the Smithfield Martyrs, and it's a list of all of the various religious martyrs who were burned at Smithfield. Smithfield was surrounded by religious houses in the late 1300s. To the north, like I said, was St. Mary Clerkenwell, the Augustinian nunnery. To the south, St. Bartholomew's Priory, also Augustinian, and the origin of the Bart's hospital system in Britain. Beyond St. Mary Clerkenwell was St. John Clerkenwell, the Priory of the Knights Hospitallers. The religious landscape was dismantled during the Reformation, but its impact is still there. In 1348, Walter de Manny leased 13 acres of land from St. Bartholomew's Hospital at Spittlecroft, north of Long Lane, for a Black Death cemetery and pit, basically a place to bury the people who, were, who died during the Black Death. He built a chapel and a hermitage, which were later renamed New Church Hall. But in 1371, the land was used to establish Charter House, the Carthusian Monastery, which served as a Tudor mansion, school, almshouse, and is still home to 40 brothers. And of course, we know about Charter House because of the monks who refused to recognize Henry VIII as the head of the church. So we hear about the Charter House monks a lot. The influence of Barts can still be felt. The church and hints of the cloister remain, and the hospital became a major presence in Smithfield, renowned in the medical world. For nearly 700 years, it was also home to the debauched Bartholomew Fair, which offered three days of revelry and music and partying and all kinds of debauchery before it was shut down in 1855. Smithfield Market has been trading meat for over 800 years, making it one of London's oldest markets. As early as the 10th century, it was a livestock market. In 1174, William Fitzstephen described it as a smooth field where horses were traded every Friday and swine, cows, and oxen of immense bulk were sold by peasants. There were strict costs, customs, and rules such as one penny for an ox, cow, or 12 sheep. The market grew over time to meet demand from the growing city population. By 1710, it was enclosed by a wooden fence. In 1726, Daniel Defoe called it, without question, the greatest in the world, with average yearly sales of 74,000 cattle, 570,000 sheep between 1740 and 1750. By the mid-19th century, 220,000 cattle and 1.5 million sheep were sold in a year, causing major traffic concerns. 
One of the main legacies of Smithfield Market, though, was how it drew attention to cruelty to animals. By the Victorian period, the market was heaving, and the methods of transporting and selling the animals became topics for journalists to write about. Politicians even introduced bills to help prevent some of the cruelty. No less a writer than Dickens wrote about Smithfield, a particularly disturbing scene in an article called The Heart of Mid-London. I'm going to read part of it to you to give you a sense of what Dickens saw. Please note, it's very hard to listen to, especially if you're affected by cruelty and suffering of animals. So maybe skip a couple minutes if it's going to be hard for you. He wrote, To get the bollocks into their allotted stands, an incessant punishing torture of the miserable animals, a sticking of prongs into the tender part of their feet, a twisting of their tails to make the whole spine teem with pain was going on. And this seemed as much a part of the market as the stones in its pavement. Across their horns, across their hocks, across their haunches, Mr. Bobbington saw the heavy blows rain thick and fast. Let him look where he would. Obdurate heads of oxen bent down in mute agony, bellowing heads of oxen lifted up, snorting out smoke and slaver, ferocious men cursing and swearing and belaboring oxen, made the place a panorama of cruelty and suffering. By every avenue of access to the market, more oxen were pouring in, bellowing in the confusion, and under the falling blows, as if all the church organs in the world were wretched instruments, all there and all being tuned together. All this was being done in a deep red glare of burning torches, which were themselves a strong addition to the horrors of the scene, for the men who were arranging the sheep and the lambs in their miserably confined pens, forcing them to their destination through alleys of the most preposterously small dimensions, constantly dropped gouts of the blazing pitch upon the miserable creatures' backs, and to smell the singeing and burning, and to see the poor things shrieking from this roasting inspired a sickness, a disgust, a pity and an indignation almost insupportable. To reflect that the gate of St. Bartholomew's Hospital was in the midst of this devilry, and that such a monument of years of sympathy for human pain should stand there jostling this disgraceful record of years of disregard of brute endurance, to look up at the faint lights in the windows of the houses where people were asleep, and to think that some of them had been to public prayers that Sunday, and had typified the divine love and gentleness by the panting, footsore creature, burnt, beaten, and needlessly tormented there that night by thousands, suggested truths so inconsistent and so shocking that the market of the capital of the world seemed a ghastly and blasphemous nightmare. So there you go. Dickens on Smithfield Market. It's pretty disturbing. You might wonder why a more famous market like, say, Covent Garden isn't on this list. Well, remember during the Tudor period, the area around Covent Garden was a very small suburb. It was open fields. There weren't a lot of people living there. It was between Westminster, um, the government seat, and then the city of London, the square mile that's on the eastern side after the bend in the river. So Covent Garden didn't actually have a market until the 17th century. So there we have it, markets and food shopping in Tudor London. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For now, we're going to stop it. Hop into the Tudor Learning Circle, tutorlearningcircle.com, which is a social network just for Tudor history nerds, and talk about this and anything else Tudor related. There's book clubs going on in there, all kinds of stuff. So tutorlearningcircle.com, check it out. And grab your TudorCon ticket at englandcast.com slash TudorCon to plan your trip to commune with your fellow history new best friends, Tudor history new best friends, in September of 2023. Thanks so much for listening. I will talk with you soon. Bye-bye. Blow, northern wind, ascend for maybe sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hote burd in Bauerbrieg, at soli semlis on sea. Mensch, full maiden of me.